Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelly Robinson. I'm really excited to be here today. GoTo is consistently one of my favorite conferences, so thank you for having me. Uh, I have spent most of my career as a Scala developer, um, including about three of the last years doing data engineering at an advertising technology company. When I started there in 2015, we were running maybe Spark 1.1, uh, and so it's been really interesting to see how the project has developed since then. Uh, now we're in the Spark 2.x series, and there's been a lot of developments in the language, in the framework or project or whatever you want to call it uh, since the time that I started with that. Um, as you can imagine, ad tech has a lot of data, so I spent most of my time at that company writing data pipelines using Scala and Spark, and we were doing that for our extract, transform, and load, our ETL jobs, and almost all of that was done in Spark. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that I learned from working with Spark, uh, with the added benefit of analyzing some owned passwords. Uh, pwned with a P is actually pronounced owned. Just say it with a P silent, and hackers will think you're cool. Just trust me. Um, I got out of ad tech about six months ago. These days I'm a developer evangelist at Twilio, where I get to work on a lot of fun and interesting things. Uh, if you're not familiar, Twilio is a communications company that allows you as developers to add communications into your applications with our APIs for things like voice, video, SMS, and authentication. Uh, with identity being so closely tied to phone numbers, Twilio got into the security world by acquiring Authy a few years ago, which many of you may know is a two-factor authentication provider. Uh, this is like the last I'm going to talk about Twilio, but since I work on our authentication products, I spend most of my day thinking about how we can validate and secure our online identities. And passwords have been the way that we've done that on the internet for most of the last 30 years. So when I was writing this talk, I needed some data to work with to show off Spark that was a little bit more interesting than advertising clickstream data, because I don't know about you, but I don't really care how many times somebody has looked at an ad. Uh, and fortunately or unfortunately for us, there are about 500 million breach credentials that are available for our perusing. So before we get into that, I'm going to start by introducing Apache Spark. Look at why people are using it and how the language has been developed. Um, I will give a bit of background on the state of passwords before we dive into that data. Then I'm going to show you how Spark works with a little bit of live code. And then finally, we're going to spend some time talking about the implications at the intersection of big data and security. So we can start by looking at the Apache Spark project. So Spark markets itself as a fast, unified analytics engine for big data and machine learning. And it provides a functional interface for doing this, which is going to be really familiar to a lot of Scala developers. But you can do this with languages and data processing in languages like Python, even SQL, and other languages uh, too. So it's generally thought of as an improvement on top of Hadoop and MapReduce. In fact, it was built on top of Hadoop and MapReduce. But it's up to 100 times faster than Hadoop. And so that's why it's gained a lot of popularity lately, is because it makes things so much quicker to process data. Uh, but it, we're using it to process big data, so what do I mean when I talk about big data? I mean data that can't fit on a single machine, although machine capabilities are getting better every day. So according to Gary here, we don't even need Spark. We can all just go home, talk over, just spin up this instance on AWS, and everybody will be fine. Of course, there are some companies that are doing data analysis at petabyte scale that running AWS large-scale RAM instances are not necessarily going to be the best option for you. But when people ask me about big data, like one of the things that I like to question people on is, like, is your data actually that big? Do you need a tool like Spark to work with it? We're going to assume that you do for the sake of this presentation. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But I do like to point that out, that one of the things in working with big data is knowing the size of the data that you're working with and how you can trim it down. So I digress. Uh, one of the major benefits of Spark is that it has built-in support for multiple languages and extensions. I've already talked about the language a little bit, but it also has these extensions built in for things like structured streaming and machine learning. Um, it's really been promoting its capabilities for machine learning and AI lately, uh, but as my friend Ryan likes to say, machine learning is just a carrot that you dangle in front of engineers to get them to do the data engineering work. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that Spark has a big benefit for, is that it allows you to do both on the same platform. And so I think that's really valuable to a team that needs to do data science and data engineering, because data science uh, is not all the sexy machine learning modeling that you might think of it as. You know, if you get into an, any kind of data science team, a lot of the time you're going to spend is doing the data engineering, data cleaning, and getting things into an analytics environment that you can start looking at and analyzing your data. 
On the data engineering side, Spark has two major abstractions, and so we started with RDDs. And RDDs are resilient distributed data sets. These are the major API. It was a collection API for working with data in Spark, and so you have a lazily evaluated list, essentially, that is Spark's major abstraction for working with data and processing data with a lot of functional interfaces. Uh, RDDs aren't going away, but for several reasons that we'll cover, data frames and data sets are now the major abstraction that most people are encouraged to use. Completely unrelatedly, it drives me absolutely insane that the camel casing is not consistent on these. This is not a typo. <laughs> the S in data sets is lowercase, and I really wish they would fix it, but they're not going to. <laughs> Uh, so RDD is a little bit more about those. They're distributed collections with a functional interface. Um, and they have the functional API that, like I mentioned, is going to be familiar with, for a lot of Scala developers. Um, like I mentioned, my background is mostly in Scala. And so as a Scala team, moving to Spark was pretty straightforward. And you can see how that API works here in this little bit of code. And so we're flat mapping, mapping, and reducing in this uh, chained function for getting the word count on whatever this data set is. Um, Again, RDDs are not going away. They still have their uses. Spark is easy to use, but early on it was discovered that users of RDDs were doing some bad things unintentionally. Uh, and the creators of the language or the creators of the project really wanted to make it easy to use, and they were aware of this, and so they were working on making it better. One of these big things that people were doing was using this group by key method. And it turns out that this is really slow and not performant, and there are usually better ways to get the thing that you want. And so usually people were doing this to do some kind of counting or to do some kind of analysis on uh, similar data, same that you would think of doing a group by and a SQL query. But group by key was really, really slow, and so it would slow down your program execution a lot. And so this is from a Databricks best practices guide. And Databricks is the company that was created by the creators of Spark to offer a managed services platform on top of Spark so you can run Spark in the cloud. Uh, and so Databricks is seen as an authoritative source. And so for them to publish a best practices guide that says, avoid using this API that we wrote for you, especially in a language like Scala, which if you were here for the Kotlin talk, a lot of things in Scala are done with IDEs. Uh, you would have an RDD in your IDE, and then you would see that this method is available on your RDD and, you, or RDD, and then you would say, oh, this sounds like something I would need. This sounds like a useful thing, and you might not know that it's a bad thing to use. Uh, again, fortunately, the team was aware of this and working on ways to make this better. So how can you do things like group by in a more efficient way? And that's what led us to data frames and data sets. And so these have been around, data frames have been around since about Spark 1.6. But data frames and data sets have really only been uh, first class citizens in the Spark world since about Spark 2.0. And so it was started by developing the data frames API. And that mirrors something like data frames and Python's pandas, or Python pandas, or a language like R. And so for people that were familiar with those kind of data processing languages, uh, this is very, very similar to that. And then data sets were developed more recently on top of that to offer a strongly typed API for languages like Scala and Java that offer compile time safety. And this API works with structured or semi-structured data and contains a lot of optimizations under the hood for making this a lot faster than working with RDDs. And because data sets effectively require a schema, depending on what you're doing, they're about three times faster than using RDDs. So if you're, doing, if you're working with structured data, this is definitely the way to go. Uh, they also provide a SQL-like DSL, so you can do some of those group by uh, queries that you would want to do on your data and have those be quite fast. And you can see that SQL-like DSL in this code example, and we'll look more at that later. But you can even use raw SQL on top of, uh, on top of data sets. And again, this goes back to the fact that like, you know, Spark is a cool new thing. SQL is not a cool new thing, but it turns out SQL is really, really useful. And some of the best data scientists that I've worked with are just really, really good with SQL because that's the universal language for working with data. And so I think it's really great that Spark has, uh, has recognized that and is integrating that very closely into its API. So you remember this ecosystem and the fact that Spark supports multiple languages, including languages like R and Python. I do want to point out that Scala still has the most robust language API. 
It's still faster when using RDDs. And it also supports things like the strongly typed data sets that you're just not going to get in a language like Python because Python doesn't have compile time type checking. I mean, it kind of does in Python 3, but I digress. Uh, it's also almost all Scala under the hood for Spark, and so if you need to dig into the source code, uh, you will have a benefit for knowing Scala there. And additionally, a lot of the new things and new features that are released in Spark come first for Scala, and so you might have to wait to get that in a language like Python, whereas Scala will support it earlier. One of the big disadvantages early on was Python was just so much slower than Scala. And so this is one of the reasons that I mentioned for Scala being a little bit better as a language choice for working with Spark. Uh, and so you would have people that would learn Scala just to use Spark so they could get some quick performance improvements uh, without having to learn about Spark cluster tuning. Um, if any of you are familiar with Dean Wampler, he has a very popular tutorial that's called Just Enough Scala for Spark. And I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Uh, but as you can see with the, with the data frames API, all of that performance kind of went out the window. The performance differences rather went out the window. And now it's just as fast to run uh, with the data frames API in Python or R as it is with Scala. And that's because the way that that API is constructed, they're all executing the same code under the hood. It basically creates a, a SQL-like uh, execution layer, and it's able to do that because you provided it with a schema, uh, with the data, because you're working with some kind of structured data. I'm really excited to see where the data community goes with this. I think we've seen a lot of people using Spark mostly with Scala, uh, but even as a Scala engineer, and some of the benefits that I already mentioned, I think Python's gonna have a huge advantage moving forward just because of the community support and some of the libraries that are already supported in the Python data science community and tool set. So that's some of the basics of Spark and where we're at with the project today. Uh, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the state of passwords since it's going to help inform some of the analysis that we're doing. Like I mentioned, I spent a lot of time thinking about authentication, uh, and we have a big problem when it comes to password security, and that's that people reuse passwords, and they use passwords that are short and obvious and easy to guess. And this is a problem because even if you don't care if your MySpace account gets hacked, and every MySpace account got hacked recently, like three years ago, if that's recent. Uh, this is a problem because if you're using the same set of credentials for MySpace as you were for your email or your Bitcoin account, you're gonna have a bad time. And that's because hackers like this guy, and you know this guy is good, because on top of all that encryption, he got the word hacked to read. Uh, you know, hackers like this guy are gonna buy your leaked credentials off the internet and use them across sites on the internet to f try to make money. And people still do this because there's a lot of creative ways or even not so creative ways that they can make money off of your account credentials. So you might hope that nobody does this. Nobody uses a password as silly as one, two, three, four, five, six. Nobody writes it on their sticky note, but of course people do. In fact, this password, one, two, three, four, five, six, has been seen over 20 million times and this is according to the site Have I Been Owned, which I hope a lot of you have checked out already. And this project from security researcher Troy Hunt. Uh, Troy Hunt has access to a lot of password data from hundreds of uh, breached uh, uh, data breaches in the last several years. And he provides a web interface for searching whether your email has been included in one of those breaches. There's also an interface for searching whether your password has been included in one of those uh, breaches. And there's a couple other ways that you can access this data. There's an API for it, so you can call that API with a raw password or a hash password, or you can download all of the password data. And that's what we'll be using today to show off Apache Spark. So I'm gonna switch over. Uh, can everybody see that okay? Font big enough? Okay, so the data that we're going to be looking at is the data dump from Apache or from um, the own password site. And this data comes in a, uh, a specific format. And so it comes with hashed passwords and the count of the number of times that the password has been seen. Um, for the sake of time, I've already joined that data with some data of like known places.
plain text passwords. And so we have a smaller data set here that we can work with because working with hash passwords is only so interesting. So we're going to be looking at the plain text passwords. Uh, the tool that I'm using here is called Zeppelin. This is a uh, open source alternative to something like Databricks that allows you to run Spark either locally or on a machine that you choose. And so this is a deployment that I have just running on localhost. It's kind of like a Jupyter notebook. So you can do something with this and it has a built-in Spark interpreter. And so it's a really nice way to get up and running and demo Spark for the sake of something like this. And so I'm going to go ahead and read in our password data. Uh, I already wrote that out to a CSV. And so I can pull in all of our passwords now. And let's go ahead and see how many passwords we have. Let that run. So we have about 700,000 passwords that we're working with right now. That sounds about right. Um, you'll notice that we can also do a schema check on this. You can see a little bit of that in the uh, output that we already have. But we can print the schema using Spark. This isn't exactly what we want. Our CSV has a header, uh, so we can go ahead and use that header by setting the option on that to interpret our header. And once we do that, we'll get a little bit nicer uh, field names. So we have our password, our hash, and our count. Uh, the one thing that we still don't have is the correct types for all of those. And so count is going to not be a string file. We want us to be able to support that by numbers. And so we can tell it to infer the schema. And now we have the schema that we want. We have passwords and hashes, which are strings, and counts, which are integers. Before we actually print these out, though, I need to do something else. Uh, and that's because there's a lot of really naughty things that people include in passwords. And this is a beautiful public forum. And I don't want any of those things showing up on this screen. Uh, so I didn't already filter those out. I'm going to do that now. And so I have a text file with a bunch of bad words in it that we don't want to include. And we can read in that uh, text file explicitly. Uh, there's 63 words in there. Use your imaginations for what those include. And we'll go ahead and join these data sets together. And so I can join our bad words. And I'm going to join that on our password column. Uh, and if that contains our bad word. And then instead of doing a inner join, we're going to specify that this is a left anti join. And so the schema looks the same, but I want to print a count here to make sure that we have less. And yeah, so we got rid of about 20,000 passwords by doing that in our already a little bit small data set. And that's a lot of passwords that contain some naughty stuff. So use your imagination, like I said. We're not going to be showing that up here. Uh, so now that we have that, we can go ahead and show what our most popular passwords are. And we're going to be using this SQL-like syntax to do this. And so we can go ahead and order by our count, call that the descending, and then we can uh, show these. And so it has a handy function to show the top 20 things. Uh, this will We'll interpret everything because we have to order by things anyway. But if you didn't have any kind of ordering operation, it would evaluate this lazily and only pull the first 20 things. And so these are about what you would expect. Sequential numbers, all ones, the word password. <laughs> These are really disappointing results. The word password has appeared over 3 million times in data sets. Uh, so that's really fun to know. Please don't use these as your passwords. Uh, but there, we can do some more interesting stuff with this now. And so one of the things that I want to do is find out what the most common length of a password is. And so we can add a column to this using the with column operator. And I'm going to call that column length. SQL or Spark SQL has a built-in length function. So we can go ahead and use that. And we'll get the length of all of our passwords passwords. And so now that we have that, one of the cool things that we can do is go ahead and run some raw SQL on our password table. And so this is really awesome if you're working with any kind of team that might not have programmers on it, but has business analysts that know SQL. And so you can go ahead and write SQL like you absolutely always would have. So you can write your, you know, your sum of counts. Uh, and you could grab this from your passwords table. And then I'm going to group by and order by our length. And I did not save the password table as a table. So we need to actually create a view for this. 
And we do need to give it a name so that it knows what we're selecting from. And so let's go ahead and do that. And then we can select from our table. And once we run this, uh, Zeppelin provides some built-in functionality that's pretty cool. So you can do things like have built-in graphs, pie charts. You can think about how scatter charts might be interesting or scatter plots would be interesting for certain type of modeling or outlier data. I think for our purposes of finding the most common lengths, the bar chart's pretty easy to read. And so here you can see that six uh, character passwords are the most common. That doesn't surprise me as the fact that six and eight character password minimum requires requirements are very common. Uh, at Twilio, our password minimum requirement is 14 characters. And that annoys a lot of people, but it makes passwords way more secure. And it also encourages people to use password managers. <laughs> Um, cool, so now that we've done that, one of the other things I want to show about Zeppelin really quick, uh, it has some very cool built-in uh, analysis tools. So you can do something like filtering the password on a password light clause. And so you could do this for something, a word like Chicago. Uh, let's go ahead and put that in quotes. Um, and so you could do that, but then you can take it a step further and make this a configurable field. Uh, and so we'll need to specify that this is a field we're expecting that on. And so now you can see that this, this text box comes up. And so you can see all these passwords that contain the word Chicago. Obviously, the minimum length there is going to be 10. Um, but I could change this to be my name. And then we'd have a lot of people that are 11,000 people named Kelly. That's weird. Um, or you could you know, make this Scala, whatever you want. I would be surprised if there's any with Scala. Oh my gosh, it's probably some word that contains the word Scala. Uh, but anyway, so there's a lot of cool things that you can do with this. And I think this is a really cool kind of sharing tool that you could deploy and use within a team. Um, and it's all open source. And so you would have to manage the deployment of Zeppelin, but there, this is actively being developed. And I think there's some really cool uh, potential for using a tool like this. Uh, but that's you know some metadata about passwords. What's really fun is if you actually dig into the password data, uh, one of the obvious things that you can start to look at about passwords is like what they contain in the actual like words. And so you can look at proper nouns. And you could approach this as a few different data sets. You could look at like celebrity names or geographical places. Places. I'm going to use dog names because I love dogs. I can't have one in my apartment. I'm not bitter. That's fine. Uh, so I can read in our dog uh, JSON, and we can print the schema on this. And this is going to be popular dog names from, I think, 2006. And so you can see that it does schema inference on our uh, JSON file, too. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up. Um, and so this is what our JSON looks like. Uh, one of the cool things I think about the schema inference from Spark, and especially the Spark SQL and data frames and data sets APIs, is if I go in and add Max's favorite food here, let's say it's chicken. Um, we want to minimize that again, because Spark doesn't like multiple line JSON. If I go ahead and print the schema on this again, it's recognized that food is now part of the schema, even though this is going to be a null column for every other value in there. And so this is pretty cool because our data set here that we're working with is pretty small. But you can imagine if you have JSON log data that is very inconsistent with the type of fields that it has, if it's a semi-structured schema there, you can do the schema inference to understand if those fields exist. You can use that to inspect your data. And Spark will do the heavy lifting there. You don't have to build all the encoders for understanding what kind of fields are in your JSON. And it also allows you to change your JSON a little bit more seamlessly. All right, so now that we have that, we can go ahead and rejoin these things together uh, with our passwords and see what is contained in those. So we want our passwords password column, uh, and if that contains our uh, dog column. And then I'm just going to default this to be an inner join. You don't have to provide the type of join that it has. Uh, we'll go ahead and show that. Uh, well, let's first uh, only select the fields that we want. And so I want the name, oops, the password, and then the count. Uh, and let's also order this by a descending count. That's because I didn't type the right field. All right, um, so now that we have this, we'll get the most common name, dog names that are in passwords. Our friend Charlie here is very loved. You can see that he shows up in about 15,000 passwords. Uh, one other thing that I want to show you now is you can 
So we looked at the length function, which is a built-in function for Spark SQL, uh, but you can define your own uh, UDFs or user-defined functions, and so I'm going to define one that's lowercase, and that's a UDF, and the syntax for this is a little weird, so this is takes in a string, and then it will output whatever you tell it to, and then you can write this in, uh, in Scholar code. And so now that I have that, I can go ahead and lowercase my dog name and see if that's more common. You see how we have our user-defined function there. And so now our passwords jumped up from 15,000 to 278,000 times that Charlie has been used in password names. And so that's, you know, a little sad and happy at the same time. It means Charlie's very loved, but probably don't use your dog name in your password. Uh, I'm going to stop the live code there because there's a couple other things that I want to wrap up. Uh, uh, yes, if nothing else, I think we've learned not to include our dog names in our passwords. Uh, really, this whole talk revolved on me using a dog rights tweet. I did modify the text of this one. He hasn't actually texted about using passwords. Uh, unfortunately, maybe someday. But in all seriousness, uh, some of the benefits of using Spark that I think we've seen, so not only is it fast and flexible, but it's really good for exploration and it's proven for large systems. And so I really love it that you can take something like Spark that is really robust and use something as proven and tried as a language like SQL and use it in the same way. I think this is going to be really powerful for teams that work together in data science and data engineering capacities. I know I've done that at different companies and it's very, very valuable to have a tool set that can work for both teams. And any kind of tool set that is going to support that is going to have a huge advantage. Of course, we're not without challenges, and I want to highlight some of the challenges uh, in operationalizing because while it's pretty easy for me to spin up Zeppelin on my local machine, it's definitely not as easy to do that across a data cluster. And that's the entire reason that this is useful is because you want to be running something like this on distributed data. Uh, it's still a young project, though. Like I mentioned, it's only been GA for about three or four years. And all of this is getting better all the time. There's always new tooling that's coming out. The documentation is currently, is consistently being improved. Uh, the subnote here that you can find these in my slides when I post them, uh, Heather Miller, who is a computer science professor and does a lot of research and work with Spark and Scala, just published this great blog post earlier this month on how to deploy Spark on a cluster, because this isn't something that really existed before earlier this month. And so she has a great tutorial for that if you want to check that out. Um, I included this error message on the off chance that my live coding went perfectly, but this is something that we didn't see, uh, which is you can get these really nested uh, error messages that are really crazy and obscure and hard to follow when you're working with a language like Spark. Um, this is something when I was initially, initially exploring this data set, again, just on my local machine, I was trying to join two tables together, and I was getting a really obscure join message that was saying the join key couldn't be found, but it wasn't telling me what join key it was looking for. And so there's things like that that are still a little challenging to parse through and understand where you're actually making mistakes. With regards to documentation, I do want to give a shout out to this documentation that's been compiled by Yatsek. Uh, and so he has some documentation for mastering Apache Spark and a companion guide for mastering Spark SQL. Uh, you might have noticed during the live code portion that there's a, a few different ways that we kind of uh, looked at what data columns we were trying to pull, and so there was that dollar sign quote method, which is an alias for uh, accessing a column, which is an alias for accessing the table that accesses the column. There's like a lot of different ways you can do this, and none of it is terribly well documented. But Yatsek has done all that documentation for us, so I'm very grateful for him. I know that's somebody that's been working with Spark a lot, that I have referenced this a lot, and it's not super easy to find because it's not part of the official documentation. So if you're part of the Spark community and you uh, are working with this kind of stuff, definitely contribute back as much as you can. And finally, I want to leave you thinking about some of the security implications of working with big data. It's a really useful tool for finding bad things and for analyzing large systems and gaining insights into your business, but you could also be the target of the next compromised database. I think data privacy is on everybody's mind lately, whether it's GDPR, 
And as I say that, some of you might cringe because that's all you've been thinking. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, it's all you've been thinking about lately. And these are European privacy regulations that are going into effect next month. That's why all of these companies are emailing you right now saying that they've updated their terms of service. And that's because of these privacy regulations. And this is something that's been very, very fresh on everyone's mind, especially last year with things like the Equifax breach, more recently even with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Everybody's thinking about InfoSec and how it affects your day to day. And at this point, we really can't separate security and software development. So if, you, uh, if you're working on any kind of engineering team, whether that's a security team or not, please be mindful of the data you store and how you're accessing it. Because nobody's security is perfect. If you have influence over the security at your company, including if your company, and especially if your company is too small to have a dedicated security team, uh, please make sure that you're storing passwords or other personally identifiable information securely. A lot of the reason that, that password data is accessible is because all of those data breaches were storing passwords in a way that could be decoded into something that uh, was referenceable or something that could be searchable. Uh, and same goes with email addresses. That's all their PII that people can use to, uh, to breach other accounts. So this tweet, if you haven't seen it, came from a conversation earlier this month on Twitter where it was revealed that T-Mobile, or at least T-Mobile Austria, was storing plain text passwords. And unfortunately, the uh, support agent really, really doubled down on that uh, not being a problem, which of course we know is not true. Uh, so that's from the company side of things. What can you do as a consumer? Probably preaching to the choir in an audience like this, but use a password manager, turn on 2FA wherever it's offered. Uh, those two things alone will offer you a huge amount of security on your personal identity online. Um, and as engineers and people that might be a little bit more versed in these things, you can also do a lot to encourage your friends and family to start adapting these practices too. Uh, my dad uses a password protected Excel spreadsheet to store his passwords. And honestly, I'm pretty proud of him because we'll, we'll, we'll get him on LastPass eventually. But the important thing about that is that the security mindset is there. And a lot of times that can be the biggest hurdle in convincing somebody that they need to think about their online privacy a little bit more strongly. So thank you for letting me spend some time with you this afternoon, diving into Spark and some of the, uh, through the lens of own passwords. I love chatting about this stuff, so hopefully I've inspired you to dig into your own data with Apache Spark. If you have big data, and especially, uh, I think Spark and especially Spark SQL are really great tools for doing a lot of powerful analysis. I've also decided that this, <coughs> I mean, stock photos of hackers are just hilarious. <laughs> and I've decided this lady skeleton stock photo, whatever she is, is my alter ego. So that's why I'm closing with this. <laughs> I will post these slides to my Twitter. SlideShare is apparently having some problems right now. But I will have them ready for you soon. Uh, I'm going to have a tutorial ready on uh, my blog soon to show you how to get started on, with your own data with Zeppelin and Apache Spark. Uh, come find me after this if you have any questions about Scala, Spark, or security. Once again, my name is Kelly Robinson. Uh, please use a password manager, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Kelly, and mad props for the live coding. Um, we actually have a little time for some questions from the audience, if we have any, if anyone submitted some from the GoTo app, or if Francesca has anything. So uh, in my company, we're using uh, not only Spark with Scala, but also PySpark. Mm -hmm. So when you get errors, it is amazing because you get both uh, stack, uh, stack calls in Python and, Javas, and, and Java at the same time, which, wow. you know, yay. How do you debug things? Like when something goes wrong, especially if I'm teaching someone, do you have some way to figure it's like, oh, start from the beginning or start from the end? Or? That's a really good question. I don't have a ton of experience working with PySpark, so I don't have as much to offer on debugging Python stack traces. That sounds really challenging. Uh, I mean, a lot of times it's understanding what your schemas are, what the type of data that you're working with is. Uh, using things as much as possible, like data sets. I didn't actually, I forgot to go into the data set side of thing, but you can use strongly typed APIs that will help you do a little bit of the, um, a little bit of compile time safety as much as possible. Again, that's not gonna be possible with something like Python, but 
honestly, like a lot of print statements, seeing what your data looks like iteratively. One of the things that you can do with Spark and Scala especially, and it might be similar in Python, is you saw me kind of chaining methods together. And so this is something that a lot of people will do is so you have one operation right after the other and then breaking that up as much as possible to see where something breaks. Unfortunately, I don't have much else to offer than that. You mentioned Dean Wampler's uh, Just Enough Scala for Apache Spark. Yeah. And I found that can be a good resource. I've had clients where I'll just send their point, point their data analysts who have a Python background at that and teach them enough Scala to write Scala Spark just because <laughs> the debugging is so much easier, honestly. Um, cool. Uh, any other questions from the audience or are people putting things in on the app? Um, otherwise, I have two questions for oh, you. Sweet. First of all, is, is Apache Zeppelin something I could download and install on my own laptop if I wanted to run cool Spark demos like that live? You absolutely could. So Zeppelin is open source. It's available. So search Apache Zeppelin, and you will be able to set that up. They have some tutorials on their website for getting it set up uh, on a cluster. I was following somebody's blog that was how to deploy Apache Spark on a local machine. Uh, so you might be able to search for that to get it set up. And I will include that in my cool. upcoming tutorial too. And uh, do any of the prominent uh, cloud uh, infrastructure providers have uh, Spark uh, offerings that I could use? Absolutely. Uh, so I don't know about Google Cloud Platform. If anybody here works for Google and wants to correct me, you don't work for Google anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so when I was running this in production at my last company, we were using uh, AWS's Elastic MapReduce, which is a, a tool for running Spark uh, in the cloud, and you can run it with your existing AWS S3. So we had all of our logs stored in S3, and then you can cool. use, uh, if you want to talk about authentication, I am prevent, uh, provisioning or credentialing to access different data sets and use stuff like that. Uh, if you're running something like that in a cluster, you are going to need some kind of scheduler to do that, and so you're going to be needing to use something like Yarn or Mesos. Um, and then there are also managed services, like I mentioned. So things like Databricks will allow you to do that without having to spin up your own clusters. But those come with a cost, and that cost is they are expensive. Cool. And I think we got time for a few more. Um, anything else from the audience? Otherwise, I've got one or two more. Just to repeat the question, it's, is there a good profiler that can explore a Spark memory usage? I haven't used anything on AWS. I know Databricks has some of that built into their application. We were running stuff on a mixture of AWS and uh, Databricks. Uh, so you can look at how you're uh, in Databricks. You can see uh, the memory inspection. You can also dig into that in the logs when something is running on EMR. Um, Depending on how you have that set up, if it's a persistent cluster or a temporary cluster, if you're doing batch jobs, temporary clusters sometimes will lose the log data after the fact. If so, you have to be looking at it while it's actually running. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people do when they get to the point of needing to do Spark tuning is you just add more machines, because <laughs> sometimes that can be easier than trying to be a Spark tuning expert. So that was generally our solution. <laughs> Um, one thing that came to mind for me is um, one thing that's great about the Spark ecosystem is it has data connectors for just about every file system and yep. database under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. From Neo4j to relational databases yep. to S3 and HDFS. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if anecdotally there were any of those that you found worked particularly well or were particularly painful. Um, yeah, so our, a lot of our data was in JSON format when we were reading it in, and so that was just kind of an existing thing that we had to deal with. Uh, but it, we found it was really fast to write data to Parquet format, and that's another interpreter that Spark supports, and so that's a really, really uh, efficient type of uh, uh, data connector that you can uh, hook in with with Spark. Were you doing that in S3 or just in HDFS or local files? Uh, we were doing that in S3. Oh, so you nice. were, we were saving cool. Parquet files. And then you, you do have to, the, the disadvantage with saving something as Parquet is that it's not as easy to just like read the data if you yeah. just want to inspect like an individual file, which you can do if you're saving it in something like JSON format. Um, but it is a lot faster because it's compressed. Cool. Um, uh, oh, and uh, we got one question from the audience. Um, Spark ML lib or TensorFlow? Pros and cons, or, or can you run TensorFlow on Spark somehow? I am not a data scientist on top of Spark. I've worked with data scientists, so I'm not the best person to answer that. So cool. I'll defer um, that to somebody yeah. else. Does anybody else have any experience with that? I don't know about TensorFlow, but what I will say is MLlib is against the RDD API, I okay. think. And Spark ML is the data frame equivalent that's okay. a little higher level. I think uh, I tend to get better results uh, working um, in Spark ML. But 
Cool. Thanks, everyone. All right, another round of applause for, uh, for Kelly.